Hello and welcome to episode 29 of my Kerbal Space Program NASA series. I have the X-29 returning from a aerial survey flight just to pick up a little extra cash. Starting to get a lot better at landing, um, although really I credit most of that to uh, KSB nav instruments. If you want to get serious about um, flying aircraft with Ferrum and really just in general um, and making really good approaches, I cannot recommend uh, flight instruments enough. Especially if you have some experience with other flight simulators like Microsoft Flight Simulator or um, Prepare 3D or, oh man, the other one, X-Plane. Um, it really makes lining up for your approaches at a, at a distance a lot easier. Just a couple days later, STS-14 lifts off to deliver the Harmony module to the International Space Station. Once again, going to set this up so we intercept it. I think this time I did let it get a little bit ahead and uh, had a much better rendezvous this time around. Nope, I just went straight for it. I think it's on, it'll be in the next episode where I finally figure that out. But most shuttle launches, well pretty much all shuttle launches look alike unless I get done and put it into a death roll. Just climbing up. Executing the roll program. Now, um, I may have, I haven't covered this in a while, and so if you're not completely up on all the episodes. The reason why my shuttle and the real shuttle does a roll program is if it were to go um, with the in the normal up attitude that you associate with an airplane, as it started to curve over, you'd start getting negative G's, and negative G's are a lot worse for you than positive G's. They, it pulls the blood up into your head and can cause severe headaches and um, in extreme maneuvers such as in a fighter jet it's a um, condition called red out where so much blood gets pumped into your head um, it floods your eyes and you're actually seeing through blood really nasty another the secondary reason and actually the engineering reason why it flips over is to put the tank up above it so the engines are still firing through the center of mass as they fire upward actually got a pretty good separation from this module and I didn't really go with anything fancy trying to look like the actual Harmony module um, on the real ISS but this serves pretty decent purpose and increases the uh, habitable volume of the station so it's always nice I cut out all the boring bits of the rendezvous just because that's you guys know how I'm doing it at this point Although I did a little better, you can see it took uh, just about one day to catch the station as opposed to uh, two days or four chasing it around. And this is where all of the American side labs are going to be attached, um, such as the Japanese Kaibo module and the ESA's Columbus module, or my curl, curl equivalents thereof. As I add modules, I am going to take a little bit out of each video just to show um, how the station's coming together. I'm honestly thinking about cutting these up um, into a construction montage based on how much of it I've got left. But I'll just see how that goes. Once the project's done, I mean. So that's looking rather nice, getting extremely large at this stage. And I could start moving Kerbals in and um, start goofing off and doing high altitude science, but I'm going to wait until it's actually finished so I have all the uh, science and experiment modules installed. The station's trying to orient itself. Uh, I noticed I hadn't moved the shuttle far enough away, so it's about to get caught. So I should probably get it a respectful distance away while it does its thing. Not that it really matters, but I think it's kind of cool. What about a rare night landing? And this was that um, subpar shuttle design I'd been using. 
you notice uh, I don't have the extra ballast at the uh, rear, but you can uh, still get it down pretty safely. Not really, that's the problem with these shuttle missions, the more of them I do, the uh, less I have to talk about. And 50 days after that, we have an actual, my latest design uh, revision of the shuttle launching, and this is bringing the kerbalized equivalent of the Columbus Lab up. Which really, um, it's just more habitable volume, but I did install a uh, TAC Life support um, generator. I believe that is the uh, carbon extractor. I'm not entirely certain. It's been a while since I flew this mission. But, uh, putting more habitable volume on as well as some uh, life support functions. The ST STS 15, I believe. I've got them all written down somewhere. I'm going to actually compile a list of all the different shuttle missions at the end of the uh, series, I guess for the credits, but uh, just slowly keep adding bits onto this thing. Honestly, um, if you were to build this on your own, just um, for your own sake, you could probably launch, you could probably do most of this in about three launches. Um, you could chop that main section up into about three large bits and loft it with one big kick. But, uh... This was a little tricky because there's not a docking module on the end of the Columbus mod, um... The Columbus lab. So I had to figure a way of attaching it to the station without leaving a docking port on the end. And so that, I came up with that with the decoupler. And it worked out pretty well. Um, just had to take some special care in disposing of it on the way down. So, because if I'd closed those uh, cargo bay doors, I'd be getting a lot of collider mesh conflicts and possibly destroying the shuttle. So I went ahead and left the uh, cargo bays, cargo bay doors open a little bit into uh, re-entry before I closed everything so I could dispose of it on a return trajectory. And I think the shuttle is actually shielding it from the atmosphere. I'm not 100% certain if Ferrum's modeling that or if it's just my imagination, but um, it could just be that it, um, we're so high up that it's just really slow acceleration. But on second viewing, it doesn't really accelerate much faster once it gets out of the shuttles, or where the shuttle's wake would be, so I guess uh, I was just seeing things there. Kind of line up with the localizer here. You can see the glide ratio on this is much improved um, versus the other shuttle. It's just barely losing speed. And actually, um, on an approach, you'd actually be seeing this in knots, so it actually appeared to be a quite constant speed on the way down. Even there, I'm actually picking up some velocity. Main thing is to get lined up with the runway at a distance, so the only thing you've got to worry about is uh, vertical speed and your glide slope. Once the localiz localizer switches over to fine control, that's that yellow bar, um, it's showing you how far off from the center line of the runway you are, um, much more accurately than the purple bar. Purple bar is for a distance, and the yellow bar is for uh, actual landing. Just trying to get this as close as possible. And unfortunately, with those planes on the runway, or on the uh, tarmac, it tends to hitch a little as they load into physics range, but it's not really a big deal. Fortunately, it's pretty, unfortunately, it's pretty easy to uh, start going back into a climb with this thing in that configuration, but... Once again, not too much of an issue. And this runway is actually very short compared to what you would actually land a space shuttle on, but I honestly think um, it's, well obviously, it's designed for stock Kerbal aerodynamics, so the length isn't really much of an issue with uh, stock aero. And finally, the main event for this launch, we're charting the re-entry and deployment of the Pathfinder 
probe. I was spacing my shuttle launches out to about 50 days uh, per launch. That's a little more realistic as far as uh, launch schedule goes, and it also makes the clock pass a lot faster for my uh, interplanetary probes. Because I really don't like uh, launching them and then finally getting to them like 10 videos later. And this is one I've been I've been wanting to do this ever since I started this series um, because I didn't quite know how I was going to pull it off and just completely fortuitously um, while I was designing this the Umbra Space Industries airbags came out there I don't think they've been updated for 2.5 or 0.90 but uh, they work just fine for 0.24.2 and just really fortuitously those things were available. I'm trying to set it down. You see where that Apple Apps marker is. I'm trying to get into the Cariner Valley because you can see that puts um, a lot of different biomes within easy reach. Where this is going to deviate from history is um, my Sojourner rover that's on this module is going to be my stand-in for pretty much the entire American rover program. I'm not going to build Spirit or Opportunity or even Curiosity, even though Curiosity is really um, the big thing nowadays, but um, it's going to be pretty much taking up all the duties of the um, American Rover program, although in reality the maximum distance the Sojourner Rover got from the Pathfinder base station was, I believe, about 200 meters, which is really, really short, but in Kerbal um, you don't have electronics degradation or any other things you got to worry about. And if you I think this looks a little rehearsed um, with me keeping that nose deviated from the uh, prograde marker in order to keep my uh, center, my lifting body effect up. You would be absolutely correct. This is the third time I had to land this thing because various bugs um, just about drove me insane during this. Um, I landed it. Everything went perfectly. Um, it had kind of a bumpy deployment because it came down... Um, on the side of this uh, valley wall and just kind of rolled down. It's designed to do that, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Landed it, deployed it, drove the rover about two kilometers away from the base station, and then the game just froze. Could still hear music. Um, Fraps was still trying to record at zero frames a second, but it was just completely hard blocked. Thankfully, I had saved right after putting the uh, base station down. I'd done a quick save. Modified that, renamed it Persistent, came back in, and the second I loaded, the entire base station and rover just absolutely disintegrated. There wasn't a fiery explosion or anything, it was just like silvery white particles and the entire thing destroyed. And at the end, I brought up the F3 mono, uh, menu and it said um, something like, whole system has exceeded G tolerances. Um, and I couldn't get it to load in any other way. I tried coming back to different save points, and it just would not work. So I ended up having to do the entire landing again. And this time I made sure I wasn't going to come down on that valley wall, just because... Uh, not really a good idea to do that. It can survive that, but there are potentially uh, potential complications that can arise from it. Just want to make sure I actually get into the valley... And you can see the lift to drag ratio. It's negative because the thing's flying backwards. But uh, just take the negative sign off that, and that's what the extra, <clears throat> I'm sorry, actual lift to drag ratio is um, in that orientation. Even in Duna's thin atmosphere, you get a little bit of a lifting body effect, which can be useful. Because, as I said, as originally flown, it kind of came down right about here, where you see that valley wall. And that's where the design of the probe really... Uh, came in handy because it doesn't actually have to land on its base um, like the real Pathfinder. This is cubicle, although in the rear real Pathfinder was a triangular tetrahedron, which was it closed itself at the top while still being able to deploy. Really don't have any panels that can pull that off in uh, reality. So this is kind of my compromise. And in order to make it rigid during the descent phase, I had to actually uh, connect the struts to those decouplers, which 
once the uh, once I release the parachutes, the whole thing becomes a lot floppier. But at that point, um, it's finished its descent. And there are airbags on the top. I just don't deploy those because if they're deployed when the uh, parachutes decouple, then well, it causes all sorts of collider issues. I tested this many, many times back on Kerbin, and I was still um, very happy that it worked without a hitch both times that I flew it out here. I really have no idea what went wrong with that first launch. Um, I actually liked its landing better than this one because it ended up stopping on its side and uh, deploying like the real Pathfinder. It was able to uh, tip itself over. This one comes down right on its base, so it doesn't demonstrate its uh, self-writing capability. It's a little bit of a wild descent on the way in. And at this stage, the real Pathfinder would still be enclosed in its aero shell. The, uh, it actually didn't deploy from the aero shell until quite a bit later, but as I've said before, the best, best substitute I have for an aero shell are KW rocket fairings and uh, you saw me ditch those quite a few minutes ago. And I have no idea if uh, Kariner Valley is the, I guess, canon name for this part of Duna. It could very well be, um, but this is what ScanSat has it labeled as. And the parachutes finally start to fully deploy and they stop that spin slowly drifting down and in real life you would detach the parachutes early to keep them from fouling up the uh, mechanism on the way down but in Kerbal Space Program once you hit they just kind of disappear but I was really obsessed with trying to get an airbag deployment out of this so I made a lot of compromises to my design to make sure I could I think it was all worth it because uh, it ended up being kind of cool. And on that first landing, it actually was useful because the parachutes hadn't been able to fully slow it down um, because they were coming in parallel to the ground. And so it still had quite a bit of velocity when it finally deployed. And it bounced quite a ways. It was actually, as I said, it was a much more interesting landing than this one. But... Live and learn, and uh, as I say, men plan and Unity laughs. I think Unity is a great engine. Um, I think it's gonna, it's not the flashiest thing, although Unity 5 looks pretty awesome, um, its capabilities. It's not the flashiest engine you can be developing on, but what Unity has done for gaming in general, um, and Kerbal uh, Space Program in specific, is uh, it's a very, very excellent engine. Um, it's just got its idiosyncrasies. And because I don't like creating a whole lot of uh, command groups for Infernal Robotics, I actually had, you notice the uh, dish was spinning around. I actually have that on the same command list as the uh, base pedals. Just because, um, as I said, I really don't like having a whole list of things I gotta remember. So instead of uh, having on separate uh, control list, I just lock these uh, actuators for the pedals. I want to make sure we activate that before deploying the rover. Set the brakes so it doesn't go rolling off into oblivion. And this dish is still pointed at Kerbin, and this little Inferno Robotics setup, that's just me uh, trying to get cute with my design. That's just trying to look cool. Um, and it I made it so you can point it at the moon, but you don't, or at Kerbin, but you don't really have to. I just, uh, the real Pathfinder, as I said, that was my first introduction to uh, communications in space, watching that mission. The low gain antenna, as I said, was in most space, in all space pro probes, is just a very low bit rate um, omnidirectional antenna with pretty much invincible, inf ah! infinite range, but all that is is to send a signal to the main dish to tell it where to point so it can get a uh, better signal. By setting Kerbin as my uh, target, it's able to point this dish directly at it.
as they would have in real life. In the base station, I really, there wasn't a whole lot I could put on it as far as uh, science experiments go, and I really didn't want to because so much of my Duna exploration is going to be done with my uh, Constellation mission. Really didn't want to uh, tap much out using this. And I've got the tech trees pretty much so, I've got all I need for my Pathfinder mission at this stage, so this is really just proof of concept it can be done type stuff and the rover is drastically reduced in size using tweak scale um, you can build this in, with just regular uh, KSP parts but it'll come out quite a bit larger the only thing I didn't tweak scale that's actually a Communitron 16 and because of terrain I can't go too far away from the base station without uh, breaking signal however once the uh, Duna Oh geez, um, the Duna Global Surveyor arrives, I can drive pretty much anywhere I want so long as it's uh, in the sky with line of sight to the Sojourner rover. And it's a little more uh, beefed up on the science front. And anybody who knows their space missions will know that I'm using that double C seismic accelerate, accelerometer as a... Uh, um, stand-in for what was the Alpha Proton X-ray spectrometer on Sojourner, which was actually on the back of the rover. The antenna and all this stuff was actually the front, but uh, I don't know. I think it kind of gives it a face, two eyes and a nose, so I prefer to keep that as the front. Although in real reality, it was on the rear because as the most sensitive instrument, um, if the rover were to drive into something uncommanded, um, it would not destroy its most valuable and important uh, survey instrument. Now that everybody's deployed, get a nice beauty shot of the what will be the Carl Sagan Memor Memorial Base Station. And that's just a matter of uh, starting to do some science experiments and then driving off a ways. It's extremely slow um, because those solar panels are so reduced in size it do and the batteries are so much smaller. You can see it, four batteries and uh, barely even equal the charge of one of those uh, batteries normally. Got a dust storm rolling in. Thankfully it doesn't affect solar panel efficiency yet. <clears throat> That would be kind of cool to have a uh, solar panel efficiency affected by um, e environmental visual enhancements, but could be a ways off if it's even possible. It's so underpowered, you notice I'm running these experiments multiple times. It's not getting the entire experiment set, and it's actually, it's like the code is giving up halfway through. And once Global Surveyor arrives on scene, this thing's going to be able to go all over Duna. So we're going to drive off a ways and start exploring as much of Duna as we can until Constellation arrives or we wreck this poor thing. That is it for this video. Stay tuned for further explorations of Duna and eventually uh, my manned mission. Thank you for watching.